Welcome to The Contrarians, where we are right and you are wrong. I'm Julio. And I'm Alex. Here on the show, we rage against the Rotten Tomatoes machine. For the first half of each episode, Contrarian's Corner, we trash the fresh red tomatoes and praise the rotten green splotches, making our case any way we can. The aptly titled Real Talk serves as the second half of each episode. This is where we discuss our true feelings on the movie we're covering. For more information on our podcast and to browse past episodes, you can head over to our website, wearethecontrarians.com. From there, you can also access our patron and merchandise, because capitalism. If you enjoy our attempts at comedic film discussions, we encourage you to subscribe and leave us a review on whatever podcatcher you use. If you'd like to reach out to us directly, that's what social media is for. You can find us on most platforms as at Contrarian Prime. You can also see what we look like if you go to youtube.com slash at Contrarian Prime, and you can contact us by email at wearethecontrarians at gmail.com. I think that covers it. Then it's time for the podcast. And we are recording for Contrarian's Corner for Mental. Hello, and welcome back to The Contrarians, where we're right and you're wrong. My name is Alex, joined for the last PJ party by my contrarian brethren, Julio. End of the line, my friend. This is it. After this, we pack up and uh, we leave before the cops rush in and arrest us. We take a bunch of soot and rub it on our face and put on black hoodies and we go and try to commandeer a giant novelty shark or whatever the hell happens in this movie. <laughs> we get to party with Leave Schreiber, though, at one point, so at least it's a fitting end. Dude, Liv Schreiber, Tony Collette, and... The triumphant return of Joe. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Anthony LaPaglia in the building. Not seen in the Contrarian studio since year one. A lot happened between Empire Records and Mental. Yes. For example, he developed an Australian accent. <laughs> Well, he's actually Australian, but yes. <laughs> Wait, what? Yeah, he's an Australian actor. He's from uh, uh, Adelaide. Anthony LaPagli is Australian? Uh-huh. <laughs> Blimey. <laughs> I, that is... It makes you appreciate him as Joe more, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> I also kind of feel bad about all these times I've assumed that he was Italian or, you know, Italian-American. <laughs> Because La Paglia. <laughs> that is true. La Paglia does sound like, you know, someone that Tony Soprano would put a hit out on. But uh, <laughs> there's a very, this is a teaser for the YouTube warm up. There's a very interesting piece of trivia surrounding his casting in this movie and what is left to the imagination of where his Australian talents could have been used elsewhere. So just putting that out there before we actually get into anything here that uh, by the time this drops, be sure to head over to YouTube, uh, subscribe to our YouTube account and watch the uh, warm up for this. So find out La Paglia's darkest secrets, apparently <laughs> written and directed by PJ Hogan. Is this is the last movie he's made so far? So far, man, the, the buck stopped with mental. He wrote the dressmaker, but he didn't direct it. Right, right. Uh, and then, uh, so if you go to the IMDb page, it says upcoming projects. You click there and it says in development. And it says damsel. And all it says is that it's like under genres, it says fantasy. And just production status in development. That's it. There's nobody attached. There's nothing. So who knows? <laughs> damsel and fantasy. I mean, that kind of makes sense, but. This could be, I mean, if we've learned anything about PJ Hogan over the summer is that he can take an idea and just go places that you wouldn't expect. <laughs> I mean, I would love it if Damsel turns out to be some sort of Lord of the Rings epic. And speaking of, um, you know, the idea of places we wouldn't expect to go, Mental from 2012 uh, premiered at the Melbourne International Film Festival on August 18th of 2012 and then had a release in Australia specifically, October 4th of 2012, box office return of $4.4 4 million. Again, written and directed by PJ Hogan. And we'll get into the players here in just a moment. On Rotten Tomatoes, currently looks like 44% based on 55 critic reviews and 55% is the audience score. Sad bucket. Yes, a sad, empty, or a tipped over popcorn bucket. Looks like a thousand reviews comprise that. Critical consensus being mental is a well-acted black comedy that suffers from jarring tonal shifts and a lack of comic discipline. All right. <laughs> what is comic discipline? Want some? 
once they bought this pool. Oh. <laughs> oh no. No. <laughs> Terrible. Julia, which quotes did you pull for us? All right, Alex. Green splotches from the Rotten Tomatoes website. I'm going to start with Sam Adams from Time Out, who says, artistic Jesus. inspiration. <laughs> Sam Adams was still kicking in 2012? I mean, who do you think is running that, that beer company? That's him. <laughs> anyway, Sam Adams from Time Out says, artistic inspiration can be close to madness, but mental is just plain nuts. Um. I think most of the movies we've done as PJ parties could be considered plain nuts. And then there's mixed nuts, but although he didn't direct that. Yeah, that's that's correct. Although, but we do have a mixed nuts player coming yeah. back to the contrarians. So it's all connected. The connective tissue there. Uh, yes. From a perspective of uh, storytelling, narrative, and then in the case of the financial gain of my best friend's wedding... <laughs> it has been quite the nutty journey with uh, PJ Hogan. <laughs> uh, next, Kath Clark from Time Out. Also from Time Out. Jesus, I didn't realize I pulled two Time Out quotes in a row. Can you imagine like, a magazine, a publication that devotes, that like, gives two critics the assignment? Like, you go see uh, Mental. <laughs> this was somebody that was a big fan of Muriel's Wedding. And they both come back with green splotches. That's heartbreaking. <laughs> anyway, Kath Clark says, wrong is wrong. And mental gets it wrong in too many ways. Mm. It's some deep shit, Alex. Next, Shoban Sinat from Scotsman says, a bipolar blend of Aussie kitsch and Hollywood sentiment, which relies far too heavily on the sound of music and brassy personalities. Got news for you. <laughs> PJ Hogan relies heavily on uh, Julie Andrews overall. <laughs> <laughs> uh, brassy personality. What does that mean? I don't know. I would, like when they say, "Let's get down to brass." Hardened, tacks. yeah. I guess just hardened or uh, determined. I guess set. Uh, big personalities. I mean, that's that's. How would you describe the personalities in this movie? Brassy. <laughs> um, colorful. Uh, yeah, colorful, but also like. Um, gray, sad. They sing, Alex, a lot. It turns into a fucking musical by the end. It's a PJ Hogan movie, so of course there's songs and brassy personalities, apparently. I wonder how Chauvin would have uh, described the personalities in Muriel's Wedding or Unconditional Love. <laughs> Kathy Bates, is she brassy? I don't, no, I don't think so. Maybe you could say <laughs> she becomes in the end, but she, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next, Brian Tellerico from HollywoodChicago.com says, It's a bewildery strange movie, the kind of thing that one might write off as being lost in translation from its Australian origin, before realizing it wasn't that funny there either. How does he know? Was he there? <laughs> you don't know what's funny in Australia. <laughs> Unless he was there opening night watching it in Australia. I don't know how he knows. Like somebody record uh, the audience. Not laughing. Yeah, just like legs folded, the just hand on their chin, just waiting for it to be over. Getting up and walking out as soon as La Paglia starts singing. <laughs> Fuck this. Uh, we're going to close with Brent Simon from Shared Darkness, who says, If one wants to see Tony Collette light a fart on fire, well, this misguided reunion with her murals wedding director may be the only chance they get. God, spoiler alert. I know, this motherfucker just went to the very last thing you see in the movie. <laughs> and it is a major spoiler, because without us getting into more spoilers, you would think that you're not going to see Tony Collette again at the end. It's true. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk about this. But I would say, Alex, if somebody tells you, in this movie, Tony Collette lights a fart on fire, wouldn't that automatically make you curious enough to watch it? No, <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you, no. <laughs> but fortunately, that's saved for the last 30 seconds of the movie. <laughs> Which celebrity <laughs> would have to replace Tony Collette in that sentence to make you think, okay, I, I guess I need to see this? Mm. Orson Welles. <laughs> Peter Bogdanovich. <laughs> Peter Bogdanovich. Uh, James Caan. <laughs> okay, how about you pick somebody that's alive? <laughs> uh, James Conn would have been alive during this, right? I don't know. Dame Helen Mirren. <laughs> there you go. 
<laughs> fucking. <laughs> I mean, I'll go with Judy Dench, but all right. I, I get where you're going. Uh, those are the quotes, Alex. Let's uh, let's check in on this mental asylum. Is that the official terminology? There are no psychiatrists in dolphin heads anywhere but the loony bin. And the only person in this family going to the loony bin is your mother. Psychiatric hospital uh, or mental health hospital. It appears right. to be the um, the proper term for it or psych ward. Uh, and in this movie, I mean, the movie's called mental and the word the mental is meant to be used derogatorily. And it is repeatedly. Uh, but yeah, for what we're doing, we're visiting the psych ward here. The... Uh, psychiatric hospital with our characters we meet along the way we start off with Shirley Moochmore a sweet misfit and mother of five daughters who are all convinced they suffer from various mental illnesses living in the Australian coastal suburb of Dolphin Heads and married to the often absent local politician Barry Sherry retreats into a fantasy world of her favorite musical The Sound of Music after she maniacally orders a huge amount of furniture telling neighbors her husband won it on a TV game show, she's sent to a mental institution. Barry, in his embarrassment, instructs his daughters to say she's, quote, on holiday in Wal- Wallonog, W-O-L-L-O-N-G-O-N-G, Wallonog. It's the second most said word in this movie after mental. How do you say it? Wallagnog. <laughs> Wallagnog. Dude, this movie starts like the fucking Lord of the Rings with all this these shots of like <laughs> spanning hills and mountains and stuff. And then it quickly you go, oh, because it breaks into the the hills are alive with the sound of music. And it's just more Julie Andrews. But the difference, at least with this, is there's no Julie Andrews cameo, but there's uh, the through line of The Sound of Music. And also, if you really want to, you can definitely see this as like a remake of The Sound of Music or, um, <laughs> you know, following the same story. A cover. A cover of The there Sound of go. Music. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, there's there's a lot that you can read into this movie. And uh, first of all, it's just the, the return to form for PJ Hogan. As soon as that lady broke into song, I was like, welcome back, King. Here you are, embracing... The, your love for music and just the, the weirdness of your movies after watching uh, Confessions of a Shopaholic, not even Peter Pan, right? Like two movies back to back where he seemed to be trying really hard to accommodate Hollywood <laughs> and just trying to fit with the cool kids. This is him just going all the way back to to the really off the wall qualities that I think made Mural's Wedding such a big hit such a breakthrough for him so yeah there's singing and there's australia and there's a lot of uh just weird jokes it's i i felt that he was back man were you excited to know that this last movie of his that we're covering is not just another traditional romantic comedy very colorful also Yes. The the opening, I, I don't know if my eyes were just having a hard time adjusting some of the colors and stuff, but there seemed to be like at times like a stretched image that I was probably reading too deep into of like, is this supposed to be like distressing? Is this supposed to be kind of hard to focus on? But anyway, uh, very colorful and it takes us right away into what this is going to be. And it's not a romantic comedy and it's not just one woman's quest for you know, personal redemption, a la unconditional love. There's a, you find out right away. There's, there's a, there's a lot of meat here. Well, you know what it isn't for the first 15, 20 minutes. It's not a Tony Collette vehicle. I was, he made oh, us no. wait for Tony Collette. Were mm-hmm. you worried that maybe this was another switch and bait? Like, uh, like Bogdanovich did with Tatum Neal and <laughs> she's funny that way. Well, he didn't do that. You just read too far into the fact that she was in that movie. Uh, okay. Well. Separate from that, uh, the biggest thing is Tony Collette is the first name on the the poster for this, and I believe in the opening credits. So I knew she was going to show up sooner or later because um, she's literally Julie Andrews. She's Fräulein Maria in this. <laughs> okay. So how about this? Because this thought occurred to me. Did you consider that maybe we're going to hit a scenario where this lady that that we meet at the beginning, this mom of five that's singing and obviously losing her mind, at some point in the movie, she was going to become Toni Collette? 
That's interesting, but no, I didn't consider that. I just figured this group was going to come across Tony Collette in some form or fashion, and that happens pretty quick. Uh, the oldest daughter in this, who you could argue the movie's as much her story as anyone else, Coral, played by Lily Sullivan, um, works at like a local water park. And were you able to tell right away when she was on the phone with her boss? First of all, her boss was a bit of a weirdo, but were you able to tell who that was? Or did you need the reveal later in the movie? Oh, I need the reveal, Alex. For one, I don't have the, the facility you have at identifying voices without seeing the actors. But then on top of that, man, don't blow my mind again. <laughs> this actor is not Australian, right? No. <laughs> okay. And he's putting on an Australian accent. So it would be... Did you figure it out? Because I'd be impressed. Oh, yeah. I was like, ooh, I know who that is. <laughs> well, good for you. I honestly, I thought it was Brian Brown. Just because my my knowledge of Australian actors is so limited, I have to go to whoever <laughs> sounded like a, a rough Australian. And, uh, you know, we had Brian Brown when we did Along Came Polly on the Patreon channel. So that's all right. That was the first thing I went to. He's from San Francisco. That makes sense. He's a West Coast guy. He definitely doesn't have an East Coast accent. But nails the Australian accent here. Uh, Barry, Anthony Lepaglia, Joe enlists a mysterious surly hitchhiker named Maria, I'm sorry, Shaz, to care for his family. Shaz terrifies the girls into obedience with her ochre accent, her dog Ripper, and the knife she keeps in her cowboy boot. But she also encourages them to stand up to local bullies, including the smarmy Aunt Doris. Uh, their snobbish, house-proud neighbor, Nancy, and the two mean girls who run the local coffee shop, who always forced Shirley to eat unwanted donuts. Shaz, of course, is our girl Tony Collette here showing up. Uh, smoking cigarettes, heavy eyeliner, um, ochre. I'm unfamiliar with this uh, term. Ochre is used both as a noun and an adjective for an Australian who speaks in strine, a broad Australian accent and acts in a rough and uncultivated manner. All right. Well, I mean, she definitely doesn't sound like the Tony Collette we know and love, but that doesn't mean that we won't love her anyway. Uh, there is something very special, I think, in seeing Muriel coming back, you know, kind of full circle. What's this? Almost 20 years after Muriel's wedding, right? 94? Uh, yeah. 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 So almost 20 years I know it's not Muriel, but, you know, the actress is coming back in such a completely different role. By now, she's a star. She's been nominated for Oscars and, and she's back in Australia making a weird movie with with PJ Hogan, a guy that makes weird movies, a guy that gave her her big break. You're right. She's been nominated for multiple Oscars, but she doesn't forget where she came from, man. Yeah. And she's giving it her all. I mean, it's not like she's here to do him a favor or something. She's she goes all out in this in this movie. And it's a sweet reunion, I think. PJ Hogan, this entire summer, I've been saying, when is he getting Tony Collette back? Why didn't he cast Tony Collette in this movie or, or this movie? And I guess maybe in a way he was just saving it for something special. I'm here to fulfill my destiny. Right a grievous wrong. Say the sights. Barry enlists the services of her because he, you know, mental health's not real, basically, um, or not a real thing. And he tells his daughters, he says, no one's going mental. They say the title of this movie numerous times, but uh, he definitely doesn't believe any of their problems are real. He is embarrassed by his wife's, you know, having to uh, seek treatment because of her issue. This sadly, Julio, is a, is a real thing. A lot of people subscribe to this theory. That is just all made up. Well, he's also a politician that's trying to mm -hmm. to curate his image, which was also also gave me major echoes from Muriel's wedding. Right? It's not just that we have Muriel in this movie, but also Muriel had a a father that was a politician that felt that he was more important than he really was, and and he was also he would also treat his kids like shit. He was a terrible father, and so La Paglia here, in a way, is like he took that character in gave it more layers and, and enriched it. I mean, not just him, obviously, PJ Hogan when he was writing it, but it's it felt like the the evolution. If like if uh, Mural's wedding is a Pokemon, this is like the next <laughs> level. When it evolves, it becomes mental. And who knows, like 20 years from now, mental will evolve into something else. And by then the 
the politician father will be a president, maybe, <laughs> and and he'll have ten kids. But this is it, there was a lot of a uh, back and forth, like kind of like an ongoing conversation I felt between this movie and PJ Hogan's first movie, and you can see we're. You know, they, everybody, we saw it with Bogdanovich too. Everybody has the, the, every filmmaker that has a very strong personality and a very strong style, they have their pet themes, their pet gags, they, they have a very specific sense of humor and their pet characters as well. And I think that PJ Hogan gravitates towards that kind of uh, scenario. The bad father, the the long suffering mother. I mean, that, the mom here it's a lot more fleshed out than the mom in Muriel's wedding, but it's kind of like the same thing, right? That lady, Muriel's mom, clearly was suffering from depression and she needed help, and she was uh, disrespected by her entire family. And here, thankfully, there's there's a happier ending, but it's it's still on the same ballpark that that setup. Shaz's philosophy is that the normal world is insane and the so-called crazy people are the normal ones. She leads the Moochmore girls on a dawn climb of a nearby mountain. From its peak, they each select a stone to symbolize their newfound ability to overcome adversity. Uh, who does she say? They're like talking about the normal people that have come from Australia and she calls them the control mice. I know one of them is Russell Crowe. She lists like a bunch of people that... <laughs> well, he's the, he's the, Russell Crowe is a controlled mouse that's out of control. <laughs> That's right. He's the, he's Who else does she name? name? Uh, Kate Blanchett. Oh, the first one is uh, Cammy from Street Fighter. Oh, Kylie Minogue. That's right. They, they <laughs> like she's British now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is a wild theory, and it could be very well that PJ Hogan was giving us a peek behind the curtain of what's really going on in Australia. Right? The idea that Australia, because it's so far away from everything, that's where governments all over the world send people that are mentally unstable <laughs> and so that's why everybody in australia is so quirky and so so like pj hogan <laughs> but every now and then you get an australian that gets sent back out into the world as a as a control mouse <laughs> because everybody's a lab rat and then there's the control rats that are sent out there and yeah kate blanchett kylie minogue russell crowe there might be one more it's kind of sad that they don't get to mention Sam Worthington. <laughs> There's a, through most of the runtime, I think the movie walks a very fine line between having Tony Collette's character spout these things, these theories that are very inspirational while also being borderline uh, insane. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but when the entire point of the movie is that you can't let uh, normal, in quotation marks, define your life, define your worth, then... It's almost like, well, if she's a little crazy, but she's doing good for, for these girls that are lacking a strong parental figure, then does it really matter? You know, it shouldn't the end result matter. I found that that was, that was a good angle on it, right? I mean, this is a comedy, so there's a lot of wild things that she does that are funny, but there's also a lot of uh, just heart, right? Which is kind of like what we've come to expect from a PJ Hogan movie. Like, there's, You can tell that she cares about these girls. She's trying to... Uh, get them to stand up for themselves and and stop being so down on themselves, like build up their, their self-esteem. So that's, did you feel that she was a, a sinister character that was just playing them? Or did you, were you all in on her being a, a positive role model? I can't hold back my thesis, Julio, that this is just, you know, meant to be an homage, a direct homage to the sound of music. I mean, it has the music from that movie, but also <laughs> just the way the story plays out. And yeah, Fräulein Marie is a bit uh, unconventional in that movie. Julie Andrews brings a perspective uh, to the kids' lives and, you know, a way of doing things that they're not used to. That's obviously what Shaz is doing here. And as we learn in the movie, by the end of it, she is not in complete control of her faculties and some of the things she does teach these kids can be construed as a bit dangerous or a bit reckless, but she also gives them courage to overcome some of their issues and face them head on, specifically the eldest daughter, Coral, that she kind of helps understand some of the feelings she's going through and whatnot. There's no black and white, so... Well, there is white, and in the strangest <laughs> scene in the film... Yes. Uh, the <laughs> aforementioned... <laughs> Because <laughs> I th I feel like that's where the conversation is going to take a turn. Uh, but 
Uh, before we get to that, Alex, uh, because we haven't really, we, we teased them, but by now, yes, we're getting to know Chaz. We're getting to know Tony Collette and we're forced to reckon with her teachings and trying to figure out, is this a good person? Is this a bad person? What what story am I watching, right? And whatever story it is, I'm like hooked. And then you also have the, the other superstar in this movie, right? We heard his voice on the phone and then we got a big reveal and we saw Sabretooth himself with an Australian accent and a scar that goes all across his face, across his cheek. A bit of a heroic entrance. Yeah, yeah. He. Uh... So what happens is, uh, let me get into this real quick then. Uh, Shaz encourages Coral to pursue a romance with Trout, a hunky guitar strumming lifeguard at the aquatic theme park where Coral works for an eccentric shark hunter named Trevor Blundell. This is uh, Sabretooth. Leave Schreiber. Trevor had earlier disrupted Trout clumsily kissing Coral in the shark exhibit. So what happens here, Julio, is they start kissing and he takes his shirt off and he's kind of just a bit of a fool and, you know, uh, a young guy. And he's so he is clumsy in that aspect. He's not like forcing himself on her, but he's doing it. His, his approach is so poor. She's like laughing and saying, stop. This is while leave Schreiber's entering the fray here and she he just hears her saying stop and so he assumes the worst you know <laughs> so he takes a fucking cattle prod and shocks this guy with it i didn't think of describing it as a cattle prod but that's exactly what it is yes <laughs> <laughs> that kid jumps back like three feet <laughs> after he gets cattle prod it it's it's awesome i'll temporarily paralyze you you'll be right in 20 seconds while i got you here Coral is an employee of Treb Blundell Jaws, a terror shark show. And being Treb Blundell, I'll look out for her. Now, this character, Liv Shriver, of course, we love Liv Shriver. So he already has my, my sympathy from the beginning. And then that's a pretty badass entrance. So <laughs> I'm also good. And then he has a pretty uh, deep, empathetic heart to heart with Coral, with the, the oldest daughter, where he's talking to her about life he he becomes the the father figure that she doesn't have at home and mm-hmm. i thought this was awesome like, i thought he was great he, i i thought he was going to be the good guy through the entire movie uh, you know he tells her don't uh, something along the lines of don't pursue insanity because really your sanity is all you have it's like the the, the most important thing that that you can have and uh, takes her to look at the sharks and turns the lights off. He's like, this is sanity. It, it, it's just, he puts on a good show. And I, I was mesmerized by his performance. I was like, he can be that good while faking an Australian accent. That's amazing. But then as the movie goes on, I was like, wait a second. Did he fool me? Is he a bad guy? <laughs> <laughs> That's So that is something that, that I think runs through the bulk of the movie. This idea that I had it in my head of, man, are we heading towards a, a showdown between Sabretooth and Tony Collette? Because... I mean, that is amazing concept, but also I was sympathetic towards both of them. So I was afraid of having to choose sides. Did you feel that way too? Where we're like, do I need to pick one or the other? Kind of seemed like it, yeah. Did you side with Sabretooth because he's your boy? Of course. <laughs> he he seems genuine too. And even in the end, with, he uh, pretty much is kidnapped by these gals and tied up. He uh, is still so charming in his reaction to it. Do you do you feel qualified to rate his Australian accent? Like, can you tell if it's good? I don't feel qualified to do that because I'm obviously not a native, but uh, it sure as fuck sounded good to me. We do have some Australian listeners. If y'all have seen this, tell us what you think of uh, Leif Schreiber's Australian accent. I think it's very good because he he doesn't stand out from the true Australian from the true natives in the rest of the movie. I was going to say that his accent, his early accent was better than the Paglia's, but now that seems silly. (laughs) So going back to White, the aforementioned snobbish uh, neighbor, Nancy, uh, her house is just blindingly white. Everything in there is white. She has these white couches, white ottomans, white, you know, seats in her house. And there's this very strange sequence of events, Julio where I I know this is science. If a group of women spend enough time together, they can all become on the same cycle for their (laughs) menstrual clock. Is it science? (laughs) I thought that was a thing. I mean, I know it's a thing, but I don't know if it's science or if it's just some supernatural (laughs) happening. (laughs) From the BBC, there's an article from years ago. 
The theory behind the sinking of menstrual cycles is that women's pheromones interact when they are in close proximity, causing them to have their period at the same time. Many females buy into it. Buy into it? Okay, so is it like it could be a psychological thing, right? Like you, you've heard about this your entire life and then you kind of will it to happen? I don't know. Uh, female listeners, let us know. Is this movie just perpetuating the myth that you can just that six different women can sync their <laughs> their menstruation and not only to the same like relative time period but to the the like within the seconds of each other yeah. yes so they can perform a sneak attack on a nasty neighbor yeah the idea here is that they all begin their cycle at the same time and it results in free bleeding on this woman's couch and it leads this woman to burning her furniture so weaponized menstruation <laughs> you don't see that very often in in a movie which is something you can say about several sequences in mental not a bad thing i can see how some people would say it's also not a good thing it kind of uh, you know your mileage may vary depending on how you feel about overall menstruation used as a punchline <laughs> <laughs> or, as, or as a setup for a punchline. Here you go. Is it true women who live together will menstruate at the same time? Although some women believe this, the answer experts say is no, not really. Menstrual synchrony, as it is known, does occur occasionally, but not because of the proximity of the release of chemical pheromones, which has long been a popular theory. So again, um, <laughs> the definition of irony is two men talking about women's bodies. And that's, uh, you know, okay, we're, we're analyzing a movie. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. What I'm doing right here is very quickly doing some research on this. But I think what we found from this is that this is a bit unrealistic and that, you know, a group of gals can't just will this to happen together and all start at the same time. Just like, you know, you can't force that shit at the same time. Alex, I mean, this is a movie that revels on the unrealistic, the, the whimsical, the <laughs> magical realism that we've come to love PJ Hogan for. So. If you're asking me, does the fact that this is not based on true science bother me? No. <laughs> By the time we get to this scene, I'm already, I'm all in with the idea that Anthony LaPaglia would be driving down the street, see Tony Collette with her dog and go like, oh yeah, this would be, this. I'm going to bring this woman home so she can take care of my five kids. I'm already on the on the PJ Hogan level of the storytelling. So that part doesn't bother me. It, nothing about it bothers me really. It it's more that it shakes me because we're not used to that kind of uh to this kind of sensibility when it comes to humor. I don't know if Australians have a more open mind when it comes to, you know, this joke. Like here in America 20 years ago, longer maybe, we saw Jason Biggs have sex with a pie and it just blew our minds. And that was just like the raunchiest thing we could think of uh, in a mainstream movie. And PJ Hogan, just like, ah, that's nothing. I'm going to have six women menstruate over white couches. Not even as the climax of the movie. <laughs> but just, just... You know, one of the things to call out to and being genuine here is that, you know, one of these girls is as young as 12. And I because I am a dude, cannot begin to fathom the the feeling that a young girl gets the first time that happens. And you can tell by the way these prudish people are around them. This yep. is the type of thing that, you know, proper ladies don't talk about or whatever. And so I do think in a way it's a bit of a, a jarring uh, scene of comedy, but the message is there. It's good that this is natural and this is who you are. And, you know, it's not necessarily something to be embarrassed about. And also, uh, why would you have a white couch to begin with? That's something a lot of rich people do that I don't get the white furniture. I mean, this is the same woman that was using a toothbrush to clean, to clean her, her driveway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I don't know about you, Julio, but like I, I'm not like overly clumsy, but if I had a white couch, I would never sit on it. I would just be worried that I'm going to like, you know, spill something or drool or something like that. And so there would be no fun in it. Get something with like a slick surface, like a faux leather or some shit that you can just kind of things will roll off. I don't I don't need that stress in my life, man. Yeah, I like to be able to drool over my furniture without <laughs> having to worry about staining well, I, it. When I, I take a nap, I drool. It's just a fact of life, you know. Um, but yes, here... <laughs> 
uh, our homegirl neighbor Nancy ends up burning all our furniture. I mean, not just that. Uh, actually, Alex, not just that, because the part of the plot was also that they were going to bring uh, this friend of Chaz's, I guess, to seduce the neighbor's daughter and eventually just run away with her, which also happens. It was a, a one-two punch. Maybe the menstruation was, was a that, distraction. Was uh, that Sandra? Is that the one they brought with her? Yes, Sandra. Yeah. Earlier in the movie, Tony Collette listens to this lady talk about how she... Uh, What's the the slang they use? I think her daughter says something like, "Oh yeah, my mom hates the the abos, like the Aboriginal people, I guess." And this lady Sandra, she is Aboriginal to Australia, so I guess that's another thing, right? Because it ends up like the daughter ends up falling in love with her, and they're mm-hmm. like an actual healthy, functional couple <laughs> compared to everybody else by the end of the movie. So that was that's another gut punch for for this neighbor, Tony Collette, just dispensing wisdom and teaching lessons everywhere in this neighborhood. And of course, we we joke, analyze about this scene we dealt with here and something you and I can't relate to as men. But I think it is something anyone can relate to. Man, woman, uh, skinny, portly like myself. This next uh, series of events, you know, Shaz instills his confidence in Coral. And then eventually her and Trout genuinely like fall for each other. Uh, and they spend a romantic evening together riding water slides in the nude after the park is closed. <laughs> Julio, I, I love a good skinny dip. I love sitting in a hot tub nude, but the idea of going down one of those big plastic slides that if your naked body catches one part of it <laughs> that doesn't have water on it, it's going to catch and pull. And I'm not about that, especially, you know, with an appendage hanging off that that could really do some damage. <laughs> so I was watching the sequence and I was like, why are they getting naked? They're not going to go down that water slide, are they? And, you know, fortunately, it works out for them and they have a good night together. But this this gave me more anxiety than anything else in the movie. <laughs> uh, I mean, they I guess they lucked out because n- there's not a single snag. Uh, if there was PJ Hogan doesn't show it to us. So the so the atmosphere is not spoiled. But uh, I think, Alex, you're looking at it with adult eyes. And really, you need to think you need to look back to when you were younger and you would just do anything to get laid. Oh, and absolutely. So, yeah, this, this is me watching it as a 37-year-old, not as I think these guys are supposed to be, you know, in their late teens. Yeah. If a pretty girl that you like gets naked and jumps down that tube, you're going to do the same thing. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> I think the PJ <laughs> is really holding a mirror to the truth here. I've just lived too long, man. <laughs> <laughs> but also, just the older you get, the less likely you are to survive that that kind of uh, mishap when you're young it's like ah you'll recover from anything after forcing Barry to eat a home cooked meal with his family and to seek treatment for his daughter Michelle's genuine schizophrenia Shaz reunites the Moochmore family at the mental institution Shirley tells Barry that she knows about his habitual infidelities and will no longer support his political career Barry begs her to appear at his campaign lunch uh, during this process, we also find out some horrific revelations about her and uh, Barry's relationship. Yeah, dude, this is uh, well. There's two things. One, yes, her when she talks about their uh, how they ended up together. Uh, I guess it's representative of just the way P.J. Hogan makes movies that he can just definitely go back and forth between really funny, really silly stuff, and then like get really serious and tell you some like heavy shit and then just go back to well but don't worry it's all gonna work out for the end because in that same sequence where she's talking about basically uh young la paglia forcing himself on her during a date and that ended up with her being pregnant which is the reason the only reason they end up getting married right that's like a really sad disturbing story but then in the same yeah. sequence we meet sandra that's how we meet sandra for the first time because she recognizes uh tony colette and she comes over to the table and they have like a big talk and tony colette gives uh the mom shirley like one of those pep talks that she's been giving her daughters and it's inspirational and she's you know she makes a comparison like imagine if like you have a brain tumor and the doctors here are just covering using your hair to cover the tumor what you need to do is you need to cut out the tumor and that's every time the trickle would go on these rants i was like yeah 
<laughs> take us to the next scene in the movie. Who, who are you going to cut? <laughs> I assumed that she was she was talking about La Pagle. I was like, La Pagle going to bite the dust as part of this woman's healing? Maybe. I'm all on board. But then, Alex, also, before the family reunites at the uh, psychiatric institution, La Pagle gets an Oscar clip to end all Oscar clips. Oh, yeah. I have in my notes here, La Paglia's Oscar clip. Take it away, Julio. It's like an acting clinic. He he opens up. He feels guilty, right? Because he's had dinner with them. Uh, he's been forced to have dinner with his daughters. And then he's been forced to confront the fact that one of his daughters is actually mentally ill. And then he just opens up and, and gives us his backstory. He grew up surrounded by boys that's why he doesn't know how to handle <laughs> only having daughters and uh, he always thought of his him and his brothers as the kennedys and then of course he feels like he's failed to live up to the promise of, of him being a kennedy uh, an australian kennedy mm-hmm. and this leads to i mean that alone is pretty affecting because he really sells it this is anthony lapaglia acting and this is the last time i bring up the accent alex but i really thought because in my mind, up till now, right, I was thinking, oh, Anthony LaPaglia just came to this movie to have fun, to put on an Australian accent and just have fun and be silly. And so I was the last thing I was expecting was for him to have this type of scene where he really <laughs> shows you the chops. But he does. You know, I'm like, he's not here just to be like the stereotypical bad dad. He's he's actually like a, a human being that has kind of like a, a, an origin story that explains why he is the way he is up to a point. But then the best part, I guess, or what really elevates it is that his daughters don't take it. Like they obviously they they understand it, but then the oldest daughter, Coral, tells him, tough shit. <laughs> you need to do better. And he gets up, he gets on her face, he's basically tells her, if you were a boy, I'd beat the shit out of you. Pretty much. And then he stops, calms down, sits back realizes that it's just a, the endless cycle of violence and bad parenting. And the, the button on the scene, it's amazing because one of the younger daughters comes up to him and tells him, you know, the Kennedys also had sisters <laughs> and one of them had mental issues. So you are kind of a Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> and LaPagla goes, I guess I am. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that whole sequence, I hope Anthony LaPaglia has it framed. <laughs> it's just like... <laughs> A little roll of film that's just that scene after post-production. He has it framed and it's hanging on his studio or something. I don't hate you. Who said I hated you? I grew up with boys, that's all. Trevor, again, that's uh, Leif Schreiber, reveals that Shaz is actually his mentally disturbed ex-wife. He tells Coral that Shaz is convinced the spirit of their daughter, who died in a boating accident, is trapped inside the giant preserved shark in Trevor's exhibit. Trevor is trying to move on with his life, but Shaz has repeatedly refused psychiatric treatment and instead has followed Trevor to several new towns, working her way into the trust of locals each time. Barry calls the police to have Shaz arrested, and she is confined to the same mental institution Shirley had been. Yeah, I made that joke earlier about rubbing camo paint on my face and wearing a black hoodie. That's what uh, uh, Tony Collette does and makes all the girls do. They're going to go help her take this giant shark, but it comes. The truth comes out that she's uh, she's had kind of a tough road and had a hard time dealing with it. So at this point, Alex, were you conflicted still, or were you firmly on? on Team Sabretooth as far as, uh, yeah, this woman needs to be stopped. Because I was still on Team Tony Collette. <laughs> I assumed there was more to the story. And we do get some developments throughout. But yeah, I was. it was kind of an unexpected turn, not going to lie. So I was at that point, I was just like, all right, let's see where this goes. Yeah, there is. I was just refusing to believe that that it was all a sham. Because that's the thing. Coral accuses her of playing them the entire time she just tells her look i know that what you're up to you just go from town to town and you find losers that will be inspired by your bullshit and then you recruit them into trying to steal the shark 
Mm-hmm. And the fact that this has happened more than once is insane. But of course, that's that's the way this movie rolls. No, it's like there's no way that can't be it. I, I I would like to think that there's something genuine that Tony Collette was feeling for these girls, and I I think that that is the case. I mean, the movie doesn't spell it out, but I think that she really did have a connection with them. The other thing is that because I've seen five PJ Hogan movies now before this one, and I know that some of them are pretty out there as far as where they go in terms of plot. I started fearing that somebody was not going to make it to the end of the movie. Because I was like, this is getting scary. Like, Leif Shriver looks like he means business. He He's kind of a violent man. <laughs> and, uh, and Tony Collette is acting pretty recklessly. So I was afraid that we were going to get a bittersweet ending, not a happy ending. Which... I mean, it's it's scary, but it also makes experience of watching the movie uh, more lively, right? Yeah, you don't know. Like, were you afraid for for her welfare? I guess that's a real question, Alex. When you were watching this, were you afraid that things were not going to turn out okay for Tony Collette? At this point, no. But you know, we still have a, a sequence of events that leads to a gun getting pulled on her. So, <laughs> eventually, I was worried. <laughs> the girls decide to break Shaz out of the mental institution. They do this by like a fucking musical number and uh, it causes like this ruckus and they sneak her out during it Um, and they tie up Trevor and help Shaz steal his pickled shark. Now, before this happens, we get Liv Schreiber's best supporting actor scene where he comes in drunk and telling the story, like the problems with Shaz and like the things that happened with his daughter and He's kind of not jovial, but a bit light at first. And then I forget Coral says something that like pushes him over the edge and he like fucking snaps into legitimate respected actor leave Schreiber mode. Wouldn't you agree this would this would be his Oscar clip? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, because and he's doing the thing, Alex. He's doing the thing where he's acting drunk, but he's not overdoing it. So you buy mm-hmm. it. Right. He's they gave him that scene. That's like a minefield. They're like, all right, can you do it? It's like, of course, I'm leave fucking Schreiber. So yeah, he ends up getting tied up and they they uh, enlist the services of Trout to torture him by playing songs on his acoustic guitar. Uh, Trevor manages, oh, it includes also Leif Schreiber singing along. We, we do need to come out. Um, <laughs> his his uh, reaction to being, to figure out what's going to happen is pretty funny because he doesn't try to, I expected him, him having been this really serious alpha male kind of guy, I thought that he would threaten Trout. Mm-hmm. to try to let him out and like, free him but instead he's like come on man don't do this we don't have the time <laughs> <laughs> and eventually he uses like, like a keychain of a shark's tooth or something to cut his um, ties he cuts himself free and he grabs the cattle prod knocks down a trout again and then before he leaves he takes the acoustic guitar and smashes it <laughs> I thought that was really funny so the musical number, Alex, this is, like I said, PJ's back, PJ Hogan. I complained about the lack of musical numbers, really, in uh, Shopaholic and Peter Pan. This is him back to to what he does, what he likes doing, what we like him to do. It took me back to uh, Unconditional Love, right? The, the climatic confrontation between Peter Sarsgaard on one end and then on the other end. It's uh, Kathy Bates, Rupert Everett, Meredith Eaton, and they start singing and the, the song kind of calms him down and... It looks like that singing is, it, it almost saves the day. And we have something like that here where they, how are they going to break uh, Tony Collette out of this hospital, out of this clinic? And in the world of PJ Hogan, you do it through song. And it's not just any song. It's a song that the mom was singing at the beginning of the movie. And she was lamenting that nobody else would sing with her. And now she starts singing and then her daughters join. And it's not just they join, but they, they're they really good singers. <laughs> so you can see uh, Shirley, the mom, like beaming with pride. And she goes like, my girls can sing. And it's, of course, uh, the, the song from Sound of Music. And the entire, this is such a PJ Hogan sequence. <laughs> the entire clinic comes out. Enchanted by by the song, it, the, mm-hmm. the, the orderlies, the patients, the fucking neighbor who had also ended up there and was being like electroshocked. <laughs> Just it's uh, the only thing that was missing was Julie Andrews. Oh, Johnny. absolutely! I had hope until the last second of the movie that she was gonna like pop her head out. Man, what happened? Was she just busy? I hope that it wasn't that she she felt that she wasn't gonna fall for the same thing twice. <laughs> That's what matters. But yeah, they 
they manage to escape. They they get away with it. With Tony Collette and everybody else is just distracted because they they start a fight or something, and uh, they take the the shark. Did you understand what the plan was? Like I was surprised by how because I thought it was just going to be that they they were going to take it and then dump it into the water, but that turned out to be a lot more complicated than because uh, they were trying to break the the glass in order to release it. I thought. Surely there must be a latch, something where you could just yeah. let it out. Trevor manages to escape just in time to intercept and reason with Shaz as she attempts to free the shark from its tank and release it into the ocean. The shark tank plunges into the water. Uh, this is the part where Lee pulls a gun on her and eventually he knows she needs this. So he shoots the tank and it empties all the water which must be disgusting because everyone starts throwing up. Uh, <laughs> I thought they were <laughs> I thought they were throwing up because of the the tension, but you're right. Must oh been god. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Janning Tatum and 21 Jump Street talked we have our difference of opinions of that movie, but that that's such an amazing part where he killed the first person he kills. Jonah Hill's like, "You killed that guy." And Janning Tatum just starts throwing up. I've always thought that was <laughs> hilarious. Uh, so then they have the shark and they're they've got it basically like on a pulley and they're going to lower it to the ocean, uh, but it falls into the water and it's attached to rope that entangles Trevor's legs and it takes him in with it. Uh, Shaz dives in uh, to save him, uh, but neither of them surfaces. We literally fade to black here. And then we come back at a, a political rally for Barry, Mayor Mooch, as some of the signs say. The Moochmore family perform a triumphant Von Trapp style on stage sing along of Edelweiss at Barry's campaign launch. So what happens here is he begs Shirley to come back. Oh yeah. She dumped his ass earlier yeah. in the movie. There was one of those girl power uh, sequences where she just, she packed up all his shit and put it on his desk. And she says, there's something you have to do, you know, for me to be at this rally. And he fucking walks out there and starts singing Edelweiss. I legit like laughed out loud because it's just like the perfect ending. And of course, his campaign manager there is like, what the fuck are you doing? He's like, you know, <laughs> you'll live to regret this. And he's just poorly singing Edelweiss. <laughs> and uh, yeah, this is like the launch of his campaign. I might have said campaign lunch earlier. I'm sorry. It's late. But anyway, um Right when it seems like it, all hope is lost and the crowd's just looking at him like, what the fuck is he doing? The family comes out on stage and starts singing. And then it eventually leads to like fucking uh, Anthony LaPaglia raising his arms and the whole crowd stands <laughs> up and starts singing. And then there's the awesome line of this woman looking at uh, her husband and be like, oh, they're just like the Von Trapps. <laughs> That's the uh, it's going to be OK, honey. Julie Andrews is in the cockpit. <laughs> yeah, it's tremendous. And. Feels like the perfect ending. Uh, yeah, I mean, except for the part where apparently we lost Sabretooth and, and Tony Collette. Well, let's dog ear that discussion for real talk, but we'll just round out here <laughs> how the movie closes, how it does yeah. close. The girl's Aunt Doris, whose hobby is making elaborate costumes for porcelain dolls, has a final confrontation with Shaz in her doll display room. I lived, Shaz screams, then pulls down her jeans and lights a fart with her cigarette lighter, <laughs> setting fire to the room and the entire house. Then she races out the front door, kicking over a garbage bin, which has left her able to win in triumph. And then we hit the credits. I think there was some ambiguity there that this movie would have benefited from. But <laughs> I say that knowing that I'll never forget the moment that Tony Collette bare assed farted into a <laughs> Zippo lighter and set a room on fire. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've we've met some striking imagery this summer. A lot of it coming from PJ Hogan. And uh, this is it. This is the last of it. <laughs> the final image branded in our brains. <laughs> Tony Collette fart and fire. And if you think like this is a bit, it's not. This is literally how the movie ends. It, it is. It is. It was referenced on that quote at the beginning of Contrarian's Quarter. And like I said, that is something that if somebody told me that that happened, I would have to check out the movie just to to see. Dude, it's the, the ending of the Neon Demon. Like you read that and you're like, that's not what happens. Like I remember <laughs> reading that. I told that story on the Neon yep. Demon episode we did. I read the fucking plot synopsis and two reviews that said how the movie ended. And I go, that's not what happens until I saw it for myself. So this movie got a wider release that might have benefited from it. You won't believe what happens in the last 30 seconds of this movie. People asking Tony Collette, like in the in the street, 
Is that really how it ends? <laughs> Just like, you have to watch it, but run because it's not going to be in theaters next weekend. <laughs> and that brings to an end a profoundly different entry in the uh, PJ Hogan catalog and in some ways Tony Collette's catalog. Uh, Julio, this was a bit of a interesting movie to traverse in a you know kind of satirical way that we do. Uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation we're about to have in Real Talk, though. Me too, especially because I, I don't know that I agree with profoundly different. I think we're, <laughs> we're going to have to delve into that that qualifier. Let's go to Real Talk. Let's do it.